I'm Ian Porlupi, and welcome back to the Northland Workshop. Today, we're going to build this traveling joiner's toolbox. This was inspired by Paul Sellers' toolbox. He's made several of them over the years, and this is my take on it with some fairly substantial modifications. If we take a look at it, the first modification you're going to notice is the door is removable. It has a couple wooden tabs that keep it latched in the bottom, but it comes right out. There's a reason for that. The reason for that is this is actually the back of the toolbox. You'll notice that I have a little bench hook in it, a whole bunch of saws, a brace for drill bits, a square, and this divider. So the back compartment is only three inches deep. It keeps the saws and stuff like that. So if we come around to the front of the traveling joiner's box, you'll see the door is hinged like normal because I would normally have this at the edge of whatever it's sitting on so this can swing all the way down. And I have two drawers, same as Paul Sellers, the difference is instead of knobs on the drawers, I went ahead and simply drilled holes to act as finger pulls. The reason I did that is I was going to make knobs for it, but the more I thought about it, the less I liked that idea because I'm going to be pulling this drawer out all the time, all the way out and just setting it somewhere. The reason for that is due to the dimensions of this thing, it's almost impossible to get the tools that are farther back in here out with that bottom drawer on. So the easiest thing is just pull the drawer right out. With that, if I had knobs, I was afraid I would break the knobs off and it was just a whole lot easier to simply drill a couple holes. Speaking of drilling holes in the drawers, I have a hole in the back and the front of this drawer because it's symmetrical. And because of that, it doesn't matter which way I put it in, it works either way, which is good since my normal operation is going to be to pull this thing completely out. I didn't want to have to stop and spin it around and figure out which way it went in. Either way works perfectly fine. The top drawer is a little bit different. This one I'm not going to be pulling out all the time. The only time I would have to is to get to my mortising chisels. I'm not going to be using the mortising chisels very often, so I put them in the back of the drawer and normally I would just pull it out this much. While I have this drawer open, I thought we'd just take a quick look at how I have it set up. You'll notice that I have dividers in it, so that way things with cutting edges don't hit other things with cutting edges and get dinged. So I've got my bench chisels. These are what I reach for most often in the hand tool world. So these are easy access to them. I can get to all four common sizes. It's a little bit wider than the four chisels, so that way if I get a three-eighths and an eighth inch someday, I can put those in there. Next is the marking department. I've got a couple different knives, dividers, marking gauge, scratch all, the dovetail gauge that got a lot of use in this thing is in there. Then I have screwdrivers and miscellaneous stuff here. And like I said before, the mortising chisels and the card scraper burnisher is in here. They don't get used as often, so they're put to the back. Now speaking of hand tools and the tools that are going in this box, I figured it was only fair that I use the tools that are going to live in this toolbox to make this toolbox. So you're going to see a lot more hand tool work in this video than you usually see in my videos because I wanted to do this with as many hand tools as possible. The raised panel doors were cut by hand, more tenon joints were cut by hand, the box is put together with hand cut dovetails, the drawers are put together with hand cut dovetails. So a whole lot of hand tool work went into this box. It was a lot of fun. It took quite a bit more time than if I was using power tools, but I think it was worth it 
because this is going to hold hand tools. I've glued up the panels like I normally do at the start of a project and you've seen me do that before. What's different this time is instead of using the belt sander to sand the glue joints smooth and to flatten out the panels, I'm actually using one of the tools that's going to live in this toolbox, which is my number three bench plane. Well, it was all fun and games smoothing up the surface of the panels. I have a jointer, so I figure I might as well use it to square up the edge of the panel. With one edge jointed square and straight, I can use that as a guide against the fence of my ray alarm saw to rip the other edge parallel and square. And since we're going to be ripping on the ray alarm saw, I think it's good to go over how to rip on the ray alarm saw safely. You'll notice that the guard is down as close as it can get to the top of the workpiece. That's good because the rotation of the blade could try to lift the workpiece off the table and we want to make sure that the guard is there to help keep it pushed down. The other thing is the sawdust is going to be coming up and out of the workpiece and we don't want that spraying onto us. That will also help with that. You'll notice that the anti-kickback paws are down and I've tested it with a half inch piece of wood to make sure that they'll actually grab. Finally, we want to make sure we're feeding the workpiece from the correct direction. The blade is rotating this way, and whenever we're ripping on a regular arm saw, we want to oppose the rotation of the blade. So, in this case, because the blade is rotating this way, I'm going to feed the workpiece in this way. If I fed it in along with the rotation of the blade, it could grab it and launch it across the shop, and I don't want that to happen. And to cut all the parts to the correct length and to make sure that they're exactly the same, I'm using my ray alarm saw in conjunction with a stop block. I've just spent some quality time laying out for the dovetails on the toolbox and the way I did that is to use a pair of dividers to evenly space the center of the cutouts. Then what I did is I took a second set of dividers and went a quarter inch on either side of that mark to give me where the cuts need to be. So on this side, this is the tailboard. So I'm going to keep this part, this part, this part, this part, and so on and the little parts are going to get cut out. You have two options here. You can take a marking gauge and run the line all the way across the edge. And Some people like doing that. I don't particularly like to see that line when I'm done. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and mark it in between where I'm going to cut it out. That way when I'm done, I won't see the line. Now I want to flip it up on edge and continue this line right around. Now on the back side, this is the inside of the toolbox. It's going into a corner. I'm never going to see it. So in that case, I can go ahead and cut the line all the way along. I don't have to worry about seeing it ever again. What I like to do is cut all the same angle so that way once I'm used to that angle I can just go right along. Once I cut that angle I'll turn and do the other side. If I try to flip back and forth the entire time I'm more likely to make a mistake. The saw you use is important. You want to get one that feels good to you and is set up correctly. You want it to have 
a rip tooth configuration. I filed this one so it gets progressively more aggressive as it gets towards the back. And you want one with very little set. This has just enough that it doesn't bind up in the cut. The less set you have in the saw, the more likely it is that it's going to try and go in a straight line because the walls of the cut are going to pinch on the blade. You don't want them to actually pinch, you want them to almost pinch. So in this case, I've got the little notch to start in and I'm just going to go down following this line until I get to the marking gauge line. Now the key to this is don't have a death grip on the saw. You want it to be able to track in this 90 degree cut. And there's two ways you can do this diagonal cut. You can start dropping your hand as you go to follow along until you get to the bottom right here and then start pipping the saw down. like so, or you can keep the saw level along the top the whole way and go down. I find the pivoting method tends to give me a straighter cut along this line. So that, again, is to start out, you want to establish the 90 degree cut along the top of the board right off the bat, and then come down following that line until you get to the marking gauge line and then go ahead and pivot it the rest of the way just like that or you just start level and end level It's totally up to you which one you want to do. Now we need to remove the bulk of the waste and we've got a couple different ways to do that. We could just chop it out with a chisel and that works or I find a fret saw tends to be a little bit faster so I put the fret saw blade down in the curve of the saw I want to stay about a 32nd of an inch above my gauge line and go ahead and cut out the waist That's going to save me a lot of chopping with the chisel. And now I just chop out the waist down to the marking gauge line, working from one half, flipping the board over, and then finishing up from the other half. That way I don't blow out the edge chopping all the way through. Plus, this way I don't chop into my workbench top. I'm ready to lay out for the pins and there's a couple things with these boards that are going to make it a little more challenging on me. One is the fact that the side is cupped out like this. The other thing is, is that this bottom board is cupped like this. So what I'm going to have to do is 
very carefully line up this corner and this corner. I want to make sure that I don't see anything other than just a hint of daylight right in this corner. Once I know it's in place right there, I can go ahead, push down on this, take my marking knife, and mark right here. Now, double checking that this side is okay, it is, I'm going to come over here, pivot it ever so slightly so it lines up the back edge of this one, and go ahead with my marking knife again, and transfer the lines for this one. I'll keep working my way down trying to pivot it back and forth to make sure that back line is always lined up. That gives me the best chance of this thing fitting together without gaps. And just like before, I'm cutting all the ones in one direction first then I'm turning and cutting all the ones in the other direction. There, after a little bit of fine tuning with the chisel, I think that turned out pretty well. Now I can go ahead and make the other dovetails for the carcass. I've gone ahead and chiseled out the groove for the divider in the bottom of the toolbox and I've temporarily installed the side of the toolbox so I can accurately mark where the groove needs to be. Now I could measure it, but I know it'll line up if I mark it like this. Now I can go ahead, take the side off, and we can start cutting this groove. I've set my marking gauge so that the point is right on the knife line and now I can go ahead and mark for the groove all the way along. Now I've reset the marking gauge so I can mark the other side of the groove. I want to deepen those marks and cut the fibers to help reduce any tear out. And to do that, I'm just using my knife and very carefully cutting down in where the marking gauge left its mark. And I'll do this a couple times, going a little bit deeper each time. I'm using my tenon saw to cut down the sides of the groove and I have to stop repeatedly and blow the sawdust out because it gets trapped in the gullets of the teeth and when that happens it stops cutting. This isn't usually a problem with through cuts because the sawdust gets ejected out the end but here it really can't go anywhere so after a few strokes I stop blow the sawdust out. If the sawdust is particularly clingy in there, I find just a regular brush takes it out fairly well. And now with the saw cuts down to depth, I can go ahead and start chopping out the bulk of the material. The way I do that is I have the bevel of the chisel in the direction of travel. So just like chopping a mortise, every time I drive it down in, it forces the back of the chisel back that way and it breaks off a chunk of wood. Then I can go ahead and pry it out and each time I do that another chunk of wood comes out so I can remove a lot of wood in a hurry this way and get me down close to the depth I want.
temporarily assembled the case because I want to get an accurate measurement of the distance from inside this groove to the inside of that groove and the same with the top and the bottom so I can accurately size the divider. And to do that I just grabbed a couple scrap pieces of wood out of my scrap bin and I trimmed them to length to where this just fits this way all the way along and this one fits this way with an eighth of an inch of slop. The reason for that is the grain of these boards are going to run horizontally so they're going to expand and contract vertically and I don't want them to try and bust the sides or in this case the top and the bottom out of the case when they swell up in the summertime. This is the middle of winter. It's as dry in here as it can possibly get. So these boards are as small as they're ever going to get. Now that I have these sticks of wood that are the exact size, I can use these to cut the boards to length and then cut them to their final width. I used this stick to set the stop block on my ray alarm saw so I cut all three pieces to the correct length so I know they'll fit in between the sides. Now I need to trim the top and bottom board so that way they fit in the vertical space provided. What I did is I took this piece of wood that I just barely fit in the case and I marked right in the center of it and then marked in the center of this board because I really want this board to be in the center and this board and this board to be the same width. I've pushed them as tightly together as they can go because remember this is an eighth of an inch smaller so I'll mark for the width of this one and this one now, when I assemble it, I'll simply pull the top board up tight to the top and the bottom board tight to the bottom and that'll give me a sixteenth of an inch gap here and here to allow for expansion and contraction and that'll make more sense when we assemble it. For right now, all we need to do is set up the table saw to be able to rip to that line. I want the wide piece of the board to be between the blade and the fence so I'm going to measure from the tongue over to this line and in this case it is 3 and 15 sixteenths. So I'm going to go ahead and move the fence to be 3 and 15 sixteenths away from this edge of the blade so that way when I run it through that's the width I get. Now if I didn't have a table saw I could rip this on the rail arm saw. If I didn't have a rail arm saw I would go get a radial arm saw. If I try putting the divider in the groove, you'll notice that it's about a 32nd of an inch too thick. And that was done deliberately. That way I can custom fit this to that groove. The way I'm going to do that is to take my plane and put a very shallow, very gradual bevel on the end. And if you look at the one I've already done, I've got it so it fits in there snugly and it can even pick up the side. That's the fit I want. I want to make sure that I do the bevel on the same side of each board, but it's easy to remember because this side has a chamfer on it. I want to leave that alone and I'm going to bevel the inside because you're really never going to notice that this small divider or this small compartment you'd be able to see it but back here you'll never see it. So if I remember I want it on that side I'll put this in my vise and start beveling. You'll notice that I'm holding the plane at not just a slight angle this way but also 45 degrees to the direction of travel. If I went straight across like this the very first time I did it it would blow out a big chunk 
in the back. The next time I did it, it would blow out another chunk and eventually I'd just run out of end of board to tear out. By tipping it at 45 degrees and sliding it along, the effective cutting angle is still like I'm cutting with the grain the whole time. So I actually don't get any chip out at the end. And I take a few passes with the plane, and then I will check my work. That's good here. It's a little bit tight back here. And the way I know it's tight is it didn't go all the way down to the bottom of the groove. So all I'll do is focus on this end just a little bit, take a couple more passes, and I will try it again. There. I like that fit right there. Now on the bottom and the top one, I also have to do that same procedure to the long edge. That's a lot easier because it's long grain so the chance of blowing out the end is practically eliminated. What I want to do is take a look at this grain. You'll see the growth rings go this way. So if I was to plane in this direction, what would happen is it would start tearing out. I want to start on this side and go this way. Now if I put it in the vise facing me, that's going to be pretty hard because essentially I would have to pull the plane this way. I could do it, but I don't want to do it. If I flip it around and put it in the vise, now I can go ahead and plane in a much more comfortable position and I won't be going against the grain. Here I don't have to worry about the 45 degree angle. I just set it for a slight bevel and I just go along. I want the top and the bottom boards of the divider to stay firmly attached to the inside of the groove. That way, it'll act as a stiffening wing for the top and the bottom of the toolbox. To do that, I'm drilling some pilot holes for screws. And at this point, I'm ready to drill the countersinks for them because I want to plug these holes with wooden plugs so when I paint it, I won't see them. Now, an interesting thing about auger bits is depending on the threads per inch of the snail, which is the pilot screw part of it, it'll advance itself into the wood at a definite speed. In this case, this is 16 threads per inch. So if I turn this handle 16 times, it would go an inch deep. I don't want it to do that because there's only a quarter inch wood between here and the bottom of the groove. So what I'm going to do is turn this until it first makes contact with the surface and then I'm going to give it two full turns. That'll go down an eighth of an inch. One, two. And I'll repeat that process for all the holes and then we're ready to start assembly. What I want to do is put glue on everything. The latch I'm using for the drop front toolbox needs to attach to a three quarter inch thick piece of wood. Well, the top of the box is half inch. So to get around that, I'm adding this three quarter inch face frame to the front. So this will be the top piece. This will be the bottom piece with the piano hinge getting attached to this edge. To hold the face frame to the carcass, I could use glue and brads, but then I'd have to fill the holes before I paint it, and I don't really want to do that. So I'm going to use 
biscuits. Now the first step in using biscuits is to lay out where you want the biscuit slots to be cut and I've laid out for four of them. That should be plenty for this little thing. And now I'm going to use my biscuit joiner to cut the slots. It's got a spring-loaded base with a retractable saw blade and what I do is I line up with the indicator mark on the biscuit joiner right where I put the pencil mark on the carcass and I can cut the slot. With a thin bead of glue on the face frame and in the biscuit slots I can now install the biscuits which are nothing more than little football shaped compressed beechwood pieces that when they sit in the water-based glue they swell up and you get a very strong connection. The rails and styles for the doors to the toolbox need a quarter inch wide, quarter inch deep groove in them. Normally I would do that with the dado head installed in the table saw, but in the spirit of hand tool woodworking, I'm going to use another tool that's destined to live in this toolbox, and that is this Stanley 45 combination plane. Now the way this thing works, it's got a whole series of cutters that I can install in it. In this case, I have a quarter inch wide straight cutting cutter in it, and I've set the depth stop so it'll go down a quarter of an inch and I've got the fence set so it will center the groove in the style. I want to start at the end farthest away from where I am and just make a couple little cuts in it. The reason for that is these first couple passes are critical because if I start all the way at this end and push through continuously, this thing's going to dig down, down, down the whole time and there's a pretty good chance it's going to start tearing the fibers along the top of this thing. So I want to start at the far end and back up a couple inches each time and work my way backwards. The other thing I want to do I want to make sure that I keep this thing straight up and down. If I tip it one way or the other, the groove's going to end up angled. You've seen me use a drill press and a regular bench chisel to make mortises for doors before, and if you watched the nightstand build, you saw me use the hollow chisel mortiser. Well, today we're going to use this. This is a mortising chisel, and you'll see it's quite a bit different than a bench chisel because it's skinny. This is a quarter inch one, but it's very deep, and that's to give it support so it doesn't twist side to side. The way this works I want to come down to about an eighth of an inch inside from where my layout line is. Now it's important that I keep this thing straight 90 degrees this way and 90 degrees this way. So I eyeball it, make sure I'm still an eighth of an inch in from where the end of the mortise is and I'll give it a whack just like that. Now I'll come an eighth of an inch more this way and hit it again. And if you notice it moved that little piece of wood. So if I repeat the process again it just moved another little piece of wood. Now I can go ahead and lever out that little chunk of wood and the previous chunk of wood. And each time I do this, I'm going to get a little chunk of wood. 
Also, each time I do it, the chisel goes slightly deeper. I'm going to keep going along in this same manner until I get to the other side. Now I can go ahead and remove all the loose pieces. Now that I'm at depth, I'm going to come over here to my layout line and with the bevel facing into the mortise, I'm going to chop straight down. That should clean up the end of the mortise. With the mortise is cut, it's now time to work on the tenons. They're going to be an inch long, so I've set my combination square to one inch, and I'm going to put a mark right there with my knife. Now what I can do is spin it around, loosen up the combination square, and mark that line all the way across. I want to pull it across several times, going deeper each time, and you'll see what that's going to do for me in just a second. I also want to bring it around. Now, I don't want this mark on the end, because I'll see it afterwards. So, instead, I line up the blade of the square with the mark, then I transfer the mark to this corner. Now, I can find that knife nick again, line up the square, and pull it across. And I'll do that several times, going deeper each time. The reason I want to do that is that severs the fibers, and this is the line you're going to see when this whole thing's put together. So I want that as clean a cut as possible. And the knife gives me a much cleaner cut than the saw will. Here, I'm going to be sawing right across it, so this line will disappear. So I'll go ahead and mark it. The other thing this does is it gives me a sanity check. As long as when I mark this edge, that knife line lines up with that knife line. I know that everything's square and I didn't mess up. Now I need to set my marking gauge and I have the piece that this is going to go into on the face that matches this face. I'm going to take the marking gauge and line up the cutter with the edge of the mortise. Again, making sure that this face goes with this face, I can now go ahead and scribe a line along the end grain. I'll also go ahead and use it to scribe a line on the end. Now I've adjusted it to the other side of the mortise and I'll do the exact same thing on this side. This way, even if the mortise isn't perfectly centered, the tenon will be off-center that same amount, so it'll all line up in the end. The first step in cutting the tenon is to chisel down to the knife line a little bit, and what this will do is create a little shoulder that will guide my saw when I make the cut. Again, 
This shoulder right here is the most critical part in terms of how this joint looks when it's done. So we want to take our time and preserve that knife cut. To make the shoulder cuts for the tenon, I'm going to use this little homemade bench hook and all it is is just a scrap piece of one by material glued and screwed to a scrap piece of plywood with yet one more piece of one by material to it. And what this does is hooks over the front of my bench and I can now use it to hold the piece of wood steady as I cut. And I'm just going to make the cut with my little dovetail saw. The big thing here is I want to follow the knife line all the way down so it's square all the way along and I don't want to over cut it. Once I get down to the layout line on this side I can now turn my attention to the other side Now I have options of how I remove the bulk of this material. I could take a big chisel and my mallet and split cut the waste away, but on this side of the tenon I have a knot right here, so I'm afraid it's not going to split cleanly and I don't want to risk damaging the tenon. So in this case, I'm going to use my saw. I've got it in the vise at an angle so I can see down this line and this line at the same time because I need it to track both those lines. So all I'm going to do is start the cut. I'm just on the waist side of the line. I can always trim this down but it's very hard to add material back to the tenon. Now I just follow the lines. I'm down to depth here, so I'll start bringing the saw up. Now I'll flip it around and continue the cut. This time I just keep dropping the handle of the saw. until I get down to the shoulder cut. At that point, I make the back of the saw parallel with the end of the piece of wood. If I try to fit it together, it doesn't even remotely fit. So, I need to trim it down just a little bit. I know that this face goes with this face because that's where the marks are. I'm going to take my little router plane and set the depth of cut on my little router plane to just barely be above the groove, which is also the wall of the tenon. Tighten it down. Now if I put this in my vise, and now I can trim it down with my little router plane. I want to be careful of this knot right here. And that cut completes the haunch. Now I left this haunch a little long because I can always pare it down but I want to see how it fits first. The last thing to do before we try fitting this tenon is I want to come along and just bevel the edges of the tenon. That way it doesn't hang up on anything 
and start to splinter as we insert it. Now that fits nicely. It goes in with moderate pressure, but it can't fall out. But as you can see, there's a big gap here and here. That's because the haunch is too tall. So we need to trim that off by about an eighth of an inch. This raised panel is going to have a field in the middle of it that sticks up about a sixteenth of an inch above the tapered part. In order to do that, I've laid out the lines two inches in from each edge with the marking gauge. Now what I've done is clamp a straight edge onto it. And I'm going to use that with my tenon saw in order to make that saw curve. I've clamped a scrap piece of wood on the outboard edge of the raised panel so that way as I'm cutting with the rabbiting plane if any blowout happens it's on the scrap piece not on the finished panel. And I'm just using my rabbiting plane to remove everything that isn't part of the raised panel. The two critical things I have to keep an eye out for is the marking gauge line here for the final thickness. That's dictated by the slot it has to fit into. And the other thing is this fielded area to make sure I don't go down too deep there. And I've left the straight edge in place so I don't accidentally scoot that way too far. I want the front and the back of the two tills that are going to slide in and out of this toolbox to be the exact width of the toolbox. That way when I make the dovetails and it inevitably shrinks a little bit, it'll give me clearance without being a sloppy fit. So what I did is I cut the front and the back to be just a sixty-fourth of an inch too long. I then held it in the opening of the toolbox and I scored it with my marking knife so I have the exact width of the inside of that opening. Now what I want to do is use my shooting board, or excuse me, my bench hook as a shooting board. When I made this thing out of scrap wood, the only thing I really paid attention to was that this fence right here is exactly 90 degrees to this edge, and that this edge is straight. What I can do is go ahead and take my plane of choice and lean it up against the edge. Now as I feed the wood in I can go ahead and take shaving after shaving until eventually I get it down to the knife line. Now if there's a downside to the makeshift shooting board arrangement it's that I don't have the fence all the way back here. So to prevent tear out I transferred the knife line all the way around so that way it'll stop any tear out at the back. The process for cutting these dovetails is just like the dovetails for the case. I'm cutting dados in the front and back and sides of the drawers to house little partitions to keep the tools separate so that way the cutting edges don't bump into each other and get nicked. The way I did it is I laid out where it needed to be on the front and the back and I cut the walls with my dovetail saw. Now what I'm doing is using my quarter inch chisel to pare out the waste in between the saw cuts but I'm stopping about three quarters of an inch away from the end because if I was to pare all the way through there's a good chance I'd tear out this side. So once I have it down close to depth I'll flip it around, put it back in the vise from the other side and finish paring down that last little bit. And once I get close to the final depth I'll go ahead and get it exactly right 
with my little router plane. And a little bit of quality time with the number three does a great job flushing up the dovetails. You'll notice I've got it skewed at a very extreme angle so that way I don't tear out this end grain. The other thing, I want to plane in towards the drawer, not out towards the edge, because I will wreck that corner no matter how much I skew if I push the plane the other way. With the dovetails flushed up, I'll cut the grooves in the side of the drawer using my combination plane, like I cut the grooves in the case, and the last thing we have to do is install the runners for the drawers. The final thing I have to do before I'm ready for painting and installing the hardware is to install the drawer slides. And they're simply scrap pieces of wood left over from this project that I cut down to half inch wide and a quarter inch thick. And they correspond to the grooves that I cut in the drawer sides. Now what I need to do is using a set of gauge blocks so that way it remains parallel I can go ahead and use the awl and make a starter hole in the middle of these pre-drilled holes. It's important to pre-drill these runners because we don't want them to split since they are very thin. The screws themselves are just little half inch long wood screws and I'm going to drive them in with a hand screwdriver because I don't want these to split these little guide rails and I don't trust the cordless drill to do it.